everybody. I think everybody's in. I see about 87 attendees and all the panelists are here. So I just want to say hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so fortunate to have um, outside individuals who do the same work that we do from other states. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kathleen Kramer. Kathleen Kramer is the managing attorney of the Family Advocacy Unit at Community Legal Services, which represents parents in all stages of dependency proceedings. In addition to individual representation of parents in dependency court, Ms. Kramer has focused much of her advocacy on supporting incarcerated parents and their families. She recently served as a Stonely Foundation Fellow dedicated to improving reunification outcomes for children of incarcerated parents. In that capacity, she engaged in policy advocacy to improve cross-system coordination between the Philadelphia Department of Human Services and the Philadelphia prison system. Ms. Kramer earned her JD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kathleen. We appreciate it. We also have Sadika, and Sadika, you're going to have to say your last name for me so I do not butcher it. Kumanika. Sadika Kumanika is a social worker with a family advocacy unit of Community Legal Services, where she works with an interdisciplinary team of attorneys, social workers, paralegals, and a peer parent advocate support to support parents involved in the child welfare system. Prior to joining CLS, she worked as a case manager for Gold Ring Reentry Initiative, an economic justice and empowerment specialist and counselor advocate at the center. As a lecturer for the Women's Leadership Program at Clemson University, Sadika earned her master's in social work in 2019 from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sadika. We really appreciate it. We also have April Lee. She is our peer parent advocate. April Lee is the peer parent advocate at the Family Advocacy Center at Community Legal Services, where she works as part of an interdisciplinary legal team representing parents and child welfare cases. Mother of three, April has personally navigated this complex system and is now helping others to do the same. April is a community activist, poet, motivational speaker, and wears a lot of hats throughout her community. And I'd also like to say special thanks to Mimi from the ABA for helping us coordinate this and get all of us together. And without further ado, Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I'm excited to talk about um, this very challenging work in this very challenging time. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, um, the Zoom presentations are a little outside my comfort zone because I love to do as interactive presentations as possible. So what I'm hoping we can do today is try to maximize the fact that we have a nice chat box going. Um, so um, here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to do some introductions, which we've done, and we're gonna, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our office and how we operate. Then we're going to go into um, some of the challenges that we've been seeing uh, in our work uh, doing uh, family defense over the last couple of months and how we've tried to tackle them both from like a systemic level and then also um, on individual client cases. Um, I feel very, very fortunate to have all sorts of expertise that I certainly never got in law school um, on staff. And so Sadika and April are gonna walk us through understanding trauma and grief um, and especially um, what our clients are going through at this particular time um, and some tips for all of us for working with clients in crisis. As you know, our clients are always in crisis, but this is a really unique time that um, asks us to do kind of the best and hardest work that we've ever done as family defenders. Um, so uh, we need all the tips we can get and I'm really grateful for Sadika and April for helping walk us through some of that as well. Um, so just to get us started in the chat, I'm going to start talking about our representation model and who we are before we get into some of uh, the uh, information about how we've kind of managed some of the COVID challenges for our clients. But um, can we just start in the chat? Um, please feel free to put your questions as you go and I'll try to keep checking them. Um, and then we're going to leave time at the end for Q&A. Um, if you don't have questions for us, I definitely have questions for you guys. So we'll definitely um, have some time at the end for that. But feel free as you go to kind of uh, type in questions as well. 
and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, one uh, question I'd like to start with is um, a little bit of a happier question because I think we're going to talk about some some real challenges as we go forward. Um, and the question I have for you all is, um, what do you like about being a family defender? And if you're not a family defender, what do you like about working with family defenders? Um, so if you could just start chat, uh, typing those in the chat box, I'm looking forward to hearing your answers. Um, and I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about CLS and who we are. So Community Legal Services is the largest civil legal aid provider in the city of Philadelphia. Um, we represent um, parents in the child welfare system as a small part of our practice. And we have units that do all sorts of other kinds of civil legal aid. We have attorneys that handle utilities law and um, housing law and public benefits law. So we do all uh, types of civil legal aid problems. Our family advocacy unit is actually a small unit within CLS. We have seven attorneys, three social workers, uh, one peer parent advocate, April, and two paralegals and a secretary who help us um, uh, do the work that we do. And so as a result of being as small as we are, we represent probably about like 10% of parents in the Philadelphia child welfare system. So most parents in the Philadelphia child welfare system are represented by solo attorneys who don't have the kind of interdisciplinary model that we have that I'm going to talk about. So um, we're really proud of our interdisciplinary model. We really feel like it has been um, important for us to, to um, be able to meet the needs of our clients over the years. And we're actually seeing uh, more than ever in the middle of the COVID crisis, just how important it is to have the interdisciplinary model. Um, just to tell you a little bit about um, what it looks like for us and um, uh, our clients is uh, interdisciplinary support is the bedrock of our model. So that means that Clients um, often have the benefit of not just a lawyer, but also a social worker or a peer advocate or a paralegal. Um, and our paralegals often act as investigators and cheerleaders and supporters um, in very much the way that our uh, social workers sometimes do. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of our clients are able to get that kind of full team model where they're having um, a lot of support. Um, we also uh, have really great partnerships across the city. Um, we know people at the shelter system, we know people um, at uh, the public benefits office, uh, we know people at DHS, so we're constantly kind of trying to work our networks and try to get clients the best services that they can, um, including access to mental health services and, and um, drug and alcohol treatment services. Um, we also have excellent courtroom advocates. Um, and maybe April and Sadika can tell you a little bit more as we go, but um, uh, I feel like our um, advocates are terrific in the courtroom and they're very dedicated to ongoing excellence and learning and um, continuing to think about how we can do better as an advocate for our clients in the courtroom. Um, and then we combine that kind of in the courtroom advocacy with kind of the um, support in between court hearings that we're able to offer clients through our interdisciplinary model. Um, because um, as you guys all know, and we definitely see every day in our practice, in general, the most important work that you're gonna do in a family defense case is the work that you do outside of the courtroom. Um, and then I also wanna just flag that we very much believe in the potential of all of our clients. And we come to every case with a belief that our client has strengths um, that have usually been ignored and that focusing on those strengths and building on them is how we get to good outcomes for parents and kids. Um, I'm not going to spend time going into some of our outcomes, but we, if, you, if you're interested, um, you can go to our website and we've actually started uh, keeping data about our outcomes compared to outcomes in the rest of the Philadelphia system. And kids and parents uh, overall do much, much better when we're on the case. And I'm really uh, proud of that data. And you're welcome to go take a look at it, clsphila.org. Um, it's under the family law section. Um, this is just a little bit more about our model. We um, were very, very fortunate to bring in April as our first ever peer parent advocate. Um, peer advocacy has been kind of proven a, a really essential um, element of a strong family defense practice. And um, we could talk more about the um, New York study that showed um, how, how much better parents and children did 
when uh, parents were provided with a holistic uh, legal representation model. And a lot of those offices in New York have peer parent advocates. So we were thrilled um, to get funding for our first ever peer parent advocate, April Lee, um, who started with us in January, but she was just saying before the call, it feels like she's been with us much longer. And I completely agree. Like she's just part of the family. And now I can't even imagine how we did the work before without her. <laughs> um, so that's our model. Um, and I'm going to start talking a little bit about how we used our model over the course of COVID um, to kind of support our clients, both from a systemic and an individual manner. And I also am going to try to leave space for April and Sadika to jump in because so much of what we were able to accomplish systemically and also for our clients at this time is really because of the work that they and the rest of the FAU Family Advocacy Unit team at CLS did. Um, so I'm gonna get started on that. Um, so uh, <laughs> for those of you who are doing this work, I just named a couple of challenges and I'm guessing you're seeing a ton of challenges right now. Um, I, I sort of could, couldn't dream up a, a better way to traumatize uh, families than to separate them and then expose them to this kind of public health crisis um, that has led to prolonged family separation and really just a sense of like despair and hopelessness and fear and anxiety. Um, and so we've been trying to do our best to walk with our clients through all of the issues that they're facing, but a couple of things have really bubbled to the surface for us. Um, one is access to visits and I'm going to talk about those Another is access to services, um, and I'll we'll talk about what we've done around that. Another um, challenge I'm imagining all of you are seeing right now are challenges around the ASFA timeline and the kind of pressure to move families quickly to termination of parental rights after 15 months. And then we as a unit have just been thinking and dreaming so much about um, what a just system would look like for our families, knowing that uh, black and brown families are so powerfully um, policed and punished by this system. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, some of the work we've been beginning around racial justice because um, we're really excited about it. Um, so here's the visitation situation um, in Philadelphia. All in-person visits were suspended March 20th, 2020. And we just started uh, in-person visits August 31, 2020. So Monday, our clients just started getting visits. And um, it has been a really devastating time for our clients and really challenging time for us as advocates because we've had to push really, really hard. And I've done some of the most aggressive advocacy in my life trying to um, get to a place where we could restart visits. I know New Jersey recently did restart visits, um, but I'm guessing a lot of your clients went through a lot of what our clients went through, which is tremendous trauma and grief um, caused by like prolonged family separation in the middle of this like public health crisis. Um, so how did we get there? How did we get to this place? So um, what happened at, um, for us, and I guess I, sh I should start to kind of frame another thing about our practice model. In addition to a commitment to interdisciplinary work, we're also really committed to combining individual representation with systems advocacy. Um, we uh, feel like uh, it's our obligation to take what we've learned from our clients and the needs of our clients and use it to kind of um, address kind of the larger systemic problems that are causing problems in the lives of all the families that are involved with the child welfare system. So a lot of our work is also systemic advocacy in addition to individual. So I'm gonna talk a little bit around visits around the systemic advocacy that we did. And then I'm also gonna talk about some of the individual work we did with clients during this time. So this is where we started on March 20th, 2020. And um, what did we do? So uh, like all of a sudden visits were kind of yanked from all of our clients. 
on March 20th, um, the judge just, the supervising judge of family court just issued a blanket order suspending all visits, e even visits, you know, that were kinship where the, you know, child is with grandma and mom lives down the street and could go to grandma's house easily. All of those were taken away. Um, so we started by writing a letter to the supervising judge, raising all the constitutional concerns with that, all the trauma and grief and loss concerns with that, um, and asking him to issue a more tailored order that would um, meet the needs of families and also meet um, the requirements of, not, not necessarily requirements, but the guidance of the federal government because uh, you know, in late March or early April, the federal government issued guidance saying, please don't issue blanket, blanket uh, visitation bans. Those are bad for kids. Kids deserve tailored individualized visitation plans. So the supervising judge um, called me like within an hour of me sending that letter over. He's, we actually have a very nice supervising judge. And he said, um, look, I agree with you, we can't do this forever. Why don't you, you, Kathleen, see if you can pull together all the advocates in the community and see where you can get to cons as far as consensus around reinstating visits and write me an order to review and I'll consider signing it. So um, I did that. Um, very frustratingly, all of the advocates in the city of Philadelphia, besides our unit, were, um, were vigorously advocating against any and all in-person contact for parents and kids. Um, but we were able to negotiate a standing order that um, kind of eased some of the worst aspects of the current practice, although we were not able to get in-person visits immediately. Um, we did it um, ask we we wrote a standing order for the judge um, that said that all visits should be video visits instead of phone visits because the judge had earlier said well any kind of phone or video is fine. Um, we also um, wrote into the order that they not only need to be video visits but DHS must provide access to the technology to do the video visits, including internet access and devices. Um, so once we got that signed in April, the judge did sign that in April, we kept on pushing and pushing and pushing and finally DHS agreed to convene a work group around restarting visits in early June. Um, we again took the leadership uh, role in that and, and helped draft a new policy. By that time, DHS had come on board with the idea that we needed to restart visits. So they um, helped draft the policy and I helped draft the court order and um, I co-chaired the law and policy committee of that work group. And then finally, all visits are reinstated effective August 31st. The only kind of visits we're not doing yet are overnights and we expect those to start um, shortly. So that's the kind of systemic work that we did to get visits started. And it, it's a little frustrating that um, it took so much work because um, the federal uh, guidance was very strong and we all know how important access to visits are for families, but um, that's what we had to do. <laughs> so, uh, I, and at the same time, we were trying to work really hard for our clients to make sure um, that they could get through this time. And I want to just like um, allow April or Sadika to kind of chime in right now and talk about all the incredible work that they did for clients who were struggling with this. Sadika, do you yeah, want to Yeah, so once, um, sorry, I had to, I'm working with two screens here. Um, once in-person visits were suspended, you know, we, we pretty much had to get right to work. And um, I reached out to all of my clients to make sure that they all had uh, smartphones. And if they didn't have a smartphone, then we got in contact with DHS or CUA to make sure that funding would be made available to help them get the phone or tablet. And then I also went around and asked all my clients if um, they had access to internet. And that was the big thing. Um, what we learned was a lot of them didn't have access to internet. So I spent a lot of time during the first two months of COVID on the computer and um, filling out. So at the time Comcast was offering um, two months of free internet access. I think they might've extended it beyond the two months. Um, so it was internet essentials. So I made sure all my clients knew that, you know, they didn't have internet, that they could get access to this free internet service. And then those who didn't have it, I would sit on the computer 
on the phone with them or Zoom with them, and we would fill out the application together and, um, and get it set up. And it wasn't too challenging for the most part. There was one case that was really uh, challenging because she was eligible because they make it out, clients are eligible if they're low income and this client met the eligibility requirements. But every time she applied, she kept getting um, a message saying, um, like denying it, right? So what we learned after spending hours on the phone with Comcast was the former tenant that stayed in, um, that lived in the apartment she was in had an overdue bill. So, and then we had to, um, get that resolved and get her lease. And so there were a lot of different things we had to do, but we put in the time to make sure that they got access to um, internet. And that was really exciting. And, you know, to, cause it's, you know, who wants to not be able to see, um, to be able to do the virtual visits, especially since you can't see the kids in person. So that was really hard for a lot of the clients and the clients were really excited to be able to have internet access. Um, the other thing was, um, talking to clients about ways that they can maximize their experiences um, on the calls with their family members. Because, you know, some clients had newborns or toddlers, very young children, and who have short attention spans. So we talked about um, breaking up the visits instead of trying to do the whole hour visit on the, on the call um, with a one or two year old maybe break it up into like 15 or 30 minute increments, you know, but meet with the child a couple of times a week. And then we talked about ways that they can make it engaging through like reading to the kid, um, reading to their children while they're on the phone and, and just thinking about activities they can do together to make it a little bit um, more engaging. And then the other thing was, um, I spent a lot of time and, and April can speak to this too, um, particularly helping clients to deal with um, the trauma and grief of not being able to see their kids for such a long period of time. A lot of our clients were anxious, overwhelmed. Um, you know, the courts were closed. They didn't know what was going on. So during the first couple of months, I spent, I talked to so many clients for like over an hour on the phone, you know, spent a lot of time really providing emotional support and just really listening to them. And, you know, I had a lot of clients crying on the phone. Um, but we spent time brainstorming different things that they can do um, to stay and feel connected to their children. So for some of my clients, you know, who, you know, we always talk about coping strategies and um, if they like to write, I told them, you know, write a letter to your child. Um, maybe come up with a playlist that you can put together for your child and say, hey, these are songs, you know, though I can't see you, when I'm listening to these songs, I think about you. And maybe make a family photo album that you can give to the child. So we spent a lot of time doing that and, and talking about um, things that the client can personally do themselves to cope, you know, whether it is journaling or taking walks or exercising and things like that. So that was really important. Um, being, being there for them in that way was really important, um, especially in the beginning phases of uh, COVID. And April, I wonder if you could just comment briefly, like um, one thing that we talked a lot about um, in preparing for this, but also throughout the whole time that we were dealing with this or are dealing with this is like that feeling of like despair that can mm -hmm. set in. I mean, this is already a system that just seems perfectly designed to um, induce despair in parents. Um, and uh, when you can't see your kids, that it feels hopeless. And so April, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, how you helped clients to keep going and not give up. So this entire pandemic has hit really, really close to home, <clears throat> especially when it comes down to visits and our clients. It didn't, it's hard to see a finish line at the beginning of this. You know, we still don't see a finish line right now when it comes down to COVID. So it's hard to be self-motivated. And what I mean by it hit hard for me, I understand and know what it's like to miss your child, to, to go through that grieving process, to go through missing. So I was big on helping parents kind of just stay emotionally motivated and connected to their cases. Because once again, there's no finish line in sight and I know myself, you will lose motivation if you have nothing to look forward to. 
or no one reminding you why why you're still fighting, how to keep fighting. I had an open line to a lot of clients. I <laughs> drove clients to detoxes throughout this. I visited homes and dropped off food, not in person. <laughs> but I've dropped off, you know, food when as far as to buy a client, client a blender, just because the emotional process, we forget that sometimes our emotional state um, hurts our physical state. So you can like physically feel that pain and that hurt from missing your child. So anything that I can do surrounding that, I try to make it a little easier um, for our clients, whether or not that's answering phone calls, off of hours, you know, I get picked on by certain people in my unit, April, <laughs> stop picking up your phone, seven, eight o'clock at night. And I'm like, well, I can't help it. You never know um, what someone might go through. And being as though mm -hmm. I am a person with lived experience, I empathize deeply with every last client. So I kind of go above and beyond sometimes. You know, our office, the first couple months, we put together an entire outreach where every last one of us was looking for resources because everything was being stopped. Whether or not it was food, school, you know, clothing for kids and things like that. So that emotional piece, when it came down to the visits, was, I think, rough on almost everybody in our unit because you couldn't tell them, hey, this is gonna be over in a couple weeks. You got four more weeks to deal with and then you're gonna see your child. So I'm absolutely excited that um, visits, in-person visits started, but I understand that we got a whole lot more work to do. I'm just looking at the comments and loving them and um, somebody just put despair is the general feeling for most of my clients at this time. And I totally relate to that. And I think we've all seen that so much um, and trying to just keep our clients motivated to keep going is such a hard part of the job. Um, I'm going to move on to access to services. Um, I just um, in terms of services, as you guys, I'm sure you guys experience this too. All overnight also, our clients' drug and alcohol treatment programs were shut down, parenting classes were shut down, all of the things that parents were asked to do on their case plans were basically inaccessible to them. Um, and so one way that we kind of tackle that on a systemic level is um, we did, as I said before, draft the standing orders around visits. And we actually put a lot of things in that order <laughs> and those standing orders. One other thing we put in the standing order is um, clarifying that DHS as an agency has the obligation under the reasonable efforts um, standard to provide whatever parents need to be able to complete their case plan goals. And so we actually you know, put in the order that if parents need a tablet or Wi-Fi to join their digital um, drug and alcohol treatment class, then DHS has an obligation to provide that. Um, we also put in the order that lack of services for parents couldn't be interpreted as lack of compliance. I don't know if you guys have this in your court proceedings, but um, we have uh, a very compliance oriented system, um, which I could just spend a whole several hours on why that is not a system that serves the needs of kids and families. But um, one thing we see a lot is parents being blamed for you know, lack of compliance. Um, when actually um, no one ever helped them navigate the barriers that have been put in front of them. And that's especially true in the time of COVID. Um, and so in addition to this standing order that kind of clarified what the agency needs to be doing at this time to support families, we did a ton of individual advocacy also around access to services for our families. Um, and I, I'll turn it over to Sadika and April to talk a little bit about what some of that looked like for us. I mean, April mentioned it earlier. I mean, we spent a lot of time compiling um, resources and lists of um, uh, different agencies in the community that were offering um, online services because most places were shut down um, in the you know early March. So we ended up, and like April said, when you talked about the despair, right? I was thinking about the fact that um, you know a lot of clients are scared, they're, they're anxious, and they're like, so what's happening with my case? 
You know, like, am I going to be able to do the parenting class? Am I going to be able to continue getting drug and alcohol treatment, et cetera? I don't want to have to wait for three months because then that's going to prolong my case. So that's why we started getting these lists and we were able to identify um, service providers that were offering tele, um, you know, therapy, online therapy and drug and alcohol programs. We even identified several agencies that offered virtual parenting classes. Um, we also help people. I spent time with clients um, applying for uh, PUA, the um, pandemic unemployment assistance, just to make sure that people were, that were losing jobs were able to get some kind of income. So those were some of the things. Um, and then a lot of my clients who had children that were in uh, residential, residential treatment facilities, a lot of their kids went AWOL during this period. So, and many of them ended up going back home. So I had like two cases where um, I ended up working with the attorney and other parties um, involved on the case to help eventually get the case um, discharged to, to come to agreement that, you know, to let the kids stay at home with the parent because things are, are working fine, you know, like they were getting along and it just made more sense. So we were able to actually see some of that happen. Um, and you could jump in April. <laughs> I see they have family bonding on the list. Quick story. I had a client who all five of her children was with kinship and they had a 30 day notice. I pretty much did the family bonding from start to finish outside of our um, cooler worker and <laughs> made sure we found people that was going to family that was going to keep these children, take these children within that slot. Once again, we kind of, I, I, I love our office, so forgive me if I constantly plug our office because I love the interdisciplinary because where I might be weak or the lawyer might be weak or the social worker might be weak, we kind of kick it off of each other. So I'm not tech savvy, so I call Sadika, Sadika, I need a you know, release of information form. Can you send this for this client? And she has sent it to me and I handle whatever I needed to handle. So it, it definitely is even though it's individual advocacy is individual for our client but as far as the ones advocating for all these different things it's kind of all of us combined you know we all use our different strengths i've helped clients seek housing gain housing through the pandemic clients have reunified with their children we try to you know can you take your child home right now and if if the answer was yes all right, let's try to figure out and get the lawyer to put in a motion and you get everything in order in the house. Let's get these <coughs> done so this family can reunify. Um, we definitely did a lot of mental health advocacy for quite a few of our clients. That's something that Sadika might do better than me. So I call her once again, hey, can you connect and talk your social worker language? And, you know, get this handled for our client and let me know what you need from me. Um, but it was a lot done as far as the, the efforts that our entire office put in to make sure our clients had almost everything that they needed. We couldn't handle everything because COVID stopped a lot. But we definitely made sure as many objectives were completed and followed as necessary. I'm going to talk next about ASFA. I'm guessing a lot of you guys are struggling with this right now and talking to other people around the country. This has been a terrible, terrible aspect of the pandemic in that um, even though, again, there's federal guidance suggesting that we need to give each family individualized consideration and look at what barriers they face when deciding whether it's appropriate to file TPR petitions at 15 months. Um, we're still hearing across the country that judges feel and um, agencies feel compelled to follow the ASFA timeline with a lot of rigidity. Um, that's really devastating for parents and kids. Um, so one thing we were able to get in Philly that I was very uh, excited about is in our standing order that I did say in the comments, I'm happy to share with you guys. Um, our court recognized if we're not providing families with services, um, including visits, we can't be um, uh, allowing the ASFA time clock to tick. And so um, our Sup Pennsylvania Supreme Court had allowed each, um, each uh, county court to um, toll 
deadlines as needed throughout the pandemic. And so we said, you have to toll this 15 month TPR requirement and the court agreed. So right, our, our last two standing orders have told the requirement indefinitely. Um, and we'll see how that plays out as, as we go forward and as we start to re-implement um, some services for families. But like I said, our families just started getting visits on Monday. Um, in addition to the local advocacy I've done around this, I've been really excited <laughs> about um, some federal advocacy that I've been working on. Um, I've been working with a national group to kind of um, amplify this issue um, and raise the need for legislation to stop the ask the time clock during the pandemic. So Representative Gwen Moore introduced in the House of Representatives, HR 7976, please call your legislator and tell them that you support them moving this legislation forward. Um, it will stop the clock during the pandemic um, for the length of the public health crisis so that um, families have a real chance to reunify um, and COVID isn't the reason that they're um, being permanently severed. Um, also, April mentioned to me, and I, she's on a lot of national work, uh, doing some national work as well, and mentioned to me that she's hearing stories in addition to kind of the um, kind of rigid application of 15 months, also horrible stories about um, parents' parental rights being terminated by Zoom. I mean, already we fight so hard for real due process and termination proceedings. And I mean, I just, I don't know how you, how you do that by Zoom, but it's happening. So this federal legislation feels really, really important. Um, I wanna turn it over to April a little bit because April has been a powerful voice in our office and also nationally around um, rethinking the Adoption and Save Families Act altogether. Um, and I just wanna turn it over to April to talk a little bit about this article that she helped write for the Children's Bureau Express in this current, um, which is the um, Federal Children's Bureau's uh, monthly magazine. And so this is up um, in the August uh, issue right now. And you can see the link if you want, but I kind of wanted to give April a moment to talk about why, why she thinks we need to rethink ASFA altogether right now. And I might step on a few people's toes, forgive me on this one. <laughs> But not to rewrite it, I think honestly that we should abolish ASPA. And let me explain why. I'm not saying get rid of foster care completely. But as it stands now, adoption is the default, you know, uh, when it comes down to permanency or our narrow notion of permanency. So I'm really trying to get people to redefine what they look as permanency. You know, in life, life itself is transient, ever moving, ever flowing. You know, I'm not the same person I was six years ago, let alone two years ago. So to go on this notion and say that a parent should never be able to have contact with their child again is disheartening to say the least. And it's not just this law doesn't just sever the ties to the parent, but also to the children and, and siblings. I'm sorry, my nephew walked <laughs> um, in. To the, to the siblings, to the grandparents, to all your bio kin. Now, granted, in, in my case, I was able to get legal guardianship, which I was able to get my children back home. But I understand fully that a lot of cases don't in like my case in. and and I just it wouldn't be right for me not to call out ASFA in this sense it took me two years to get myself together to get on my feet to get my children back to have the house that DHS was asking for to have the stability that the system was asking for and it took two years so also a person in long-term recovery I know that even with the parents that suffer suffering substance abuse, sometimes it takes long, longer than that. If you're telling them to go into a program for a year, seek treatment, get on your feet, go through this entire outpatient IOP, which takes sometimes a year or more, where does this 15 months really fit in? So once again, I said I might be stepping on some toes. If so, it's okay. We got to be open-minded as a society to really look at this. I'm not saying that children should not have safe homes. I'm not saying that children 
there might not be cases where adoption is necessary, but at no point, at no point should adoption be the default. I'm trying to turn that hierarchy on its head and put guardianship as the default, never adoption. Adoption should be the last resource when a family cannot reunify. And April, I don't know if you can see in the comments, but you're getting a lot of support and somebody says you're not stepping on toes. We're defense counsel. You're preaching to the choir and thank you for that comment. I appreciate it because I, um, I feel like as family defenders, we know um, the harm of ASFA and also I want to like kind of go into racial justice and how we've been thinking about that. I mean, one, and this ties in very much to ASFA. I mean, I think one one thing that we see dramatically is our clients um, who are black and brown have their families t taken apart at higher rates through removal and then also have some of the worst outcomes in the child welfare system including the kind of permanent dissolution of their families um, so we've been really talking about racial justice in this moment a lot and um, using this opportunity um, with, with so much conversation around racial justice across the country to kind of uh, free ourselves to rethink all of the kind of sacred cows of child welfare orthodoxy, including the Adoption and Safe Families Act. Um, but, but even more broadly, why do we have this system of mass family separation? Um, do we need it? Does it produce out the outcomes that we're trying to get to? Um, and so we, this is just one quote, we've been doing a lot of reading and Sadika picked this one out as, as a powerful quote um, from our friend Vivek uh, Sankran at uh, the University of Michigan, um, basically saying, we know and we tolerate what we're doing to black and brown families um, and it's time to rethink our conversation around child welfare. Um, so, um, just as far as what we're doing in our office, we really want to um, push this conversation forward. And one thing that we've been thinking a lot about is how important it is that we um, start with um, how we ourselves are showing up when we do this work um, and how we are kind of showing up in the lives of our clients as we do this work. Um, so we created, and Sadika is leading um, along with our other social worker, Maggie Potter, is leading our, our own internal study group. So every other Monday we meet together and have a study group and we're asking ourselves all of these questions. Like what is, what does anti-racist mean? Um, how do you, how do you know if you're doing anti-racist work? Um, how, what can we do to elevate the voices of our clients and recognizing that they don't work for us, we work for them. Um, and how are we doing in terms of amplifying their voices and also like letting them take the lead. Like one thing that we've kind of talked about early on in some of our conversations is, um, first of all, anti-racist anti is not a noun, it's a verb. Um, it's something that you have to do every day. And part of being anti-racist is thinking about how are you showing up and using your power, um, even though I often feel quite powerless in the work that I do and I'm constantly fighting David and Goliath battles. I know that I'm showing up as somebody with a ton of privilege who does have some power um, in my client relationship and also in, in the system. And so thinking about how I'm showing up and how I'm using the power that I do have, one thing that has gotten, um, we've started thinking more about like how can we hear more from our clients um, and let them lead us more in terms of how are they feeling about our services. So one thing we um, decided early on to do is um, start uh, collecting information from our clients about like user satisfaction. Like we've been collecting data and I was talking about our data earlier about outcomes for our families. Um, and we're presuming that we're getting to great outcomes because like just to give you an example, families reunify twice as quickly um, if CLS is on the case and if there's a wheel attorney on the case, like our, our private attorneys are on the case, but how do we, and so we think that means that we're doing great work on behalf of our black and brown clients, but do they think that we're doing great work? And so we need to hear from them. Um, and I wanna just turn it over to Sadika and April to see what they wanna say about this. Any comments? Sadika, I think you're muted. Oh. I'm gonna get it together. <laughs> Thank you. I, what I was saying was, um, 
I was really, I'm really excited about our study group and I'm really thankful that Kathleen has created the space to allow us to have these conversations. And um, I think it's so important to do something like this, to have these spaces, especially at a time like now, you know, where there is so much like feeling so much despair and, and people are anxious and overwhelmed. And, and there's just like a lot of opportunity, right? Like COVID is really forcing us to like rethink a lot of things, right? These structures and these systems in society that what we're, that are, aren't really working for people on all kinds of levels when it comes to housing and food um, security and, and all of that. Um, so these, you know, having the study group for me, it, 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 I find it energizing. And, um, you know, I think it's, this is a time for us to reimagine, you know, what an equitable, you know, child welfare system could look like. And, um, and other units in our agency are starting to have these conversations too. Um, I saw a comment earlier on where somebody um, mentioned something about the fact that, you know, in New Jersey, um, they started offering telehealth services, but there's still a lot of people um, that just don't have access to cell service at all, or it's really spotty, right? So one of our units, we're, there's this cross-unit collaboration. So the Family Advocacy Unit and the Energy Unit have started this um, lifeline, this broadband lifeline working group where they're like really trying to push um, the city to provide free internet access to all the, I don't know if it's all the households in Philly, but especially since they're, you know, most of our, everybody's doing, in Philadelphia, it's all virtual learning happening right now. Um, so, I mean, I think having these conversations kind of create spaces for us to kind of put our head together to come up with some solutions. So, you know, that's something that maybe can happen in, uh, New Jersey, you know, maybe y'all can put together a working group and try to put some policies together to make sure that internet access is available to everybody. Um, so that that's some of the things that I'm excited about. I don't know if you had anything to add regarding the group. April, well, one thing I just wanted to note, and I want to see if April has anything to say too. One thing that's been, I mean, there's been so many downsides to working um, remotely and working in this time of COVID, but like one kind of cool thing about it is that um, everyone's on Zoom and everyone's working from like their kid's bedroom like I am. So um, we can actually invite guest stars to our study group. So our first study group, we actually had um, uh, Sadika's husband, who is a um, uh, an academic and has has a really important podcast about racial justice and he was like our guest presenter and we engaged with him and it, it was like so amazing to like have an expert in the room with us on on history and um uh history of movements and history of racial justice and like it was fabulous and so i'm that's one kind of exciting thing to me is like we can dream and then we can invite other people in to dream with us that's been awesome um <laughs> April, did you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, I just wanted to hit one point in working surrounding the racial justice point. We've been really talking about explaining to people why they need to leave their biases at the door. Because so often our personal biases come within our cases or within the way we treat a certain parent, which within the way you know, we approach certain cases. So definitely that need to leave our biases at the door is not just a racial justice issue, it's a personal issue as well. It doesn't have to be race for you to have a bias, but the be mindful of what we bring into each case. Be mindful of what biases we bring to the table that might be influencing our decision-making when it comes down to our clients or voicing their opinions. That's it. Yeah. I think that that's one of the most important things is, is recognizing that in yourself and being able to question that in yourself, in your representation. So thank you so much for bringing that up, April. Um, I want to turn it over to Sadika uh, and April now to talk about trauma and grief. Um, 
one thing is we were, we were presenting on this, we were talking about like all the principles of, of trauma-informed care and April's like, our clients don't get any of those. And I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> totally true. Um, but we, um, we have a role ourselves in um, helping our clients survive the trauma and grief of the system and being trauma-informed in the work that we do as, as family advocates. So, um, and one thing that um, we've been thinking a lot about, and we've had fortunate to, uh, been fortunate to have Sadika join our team. She also joined us relatively recently, even though it feels like she's been with us forever. Um, and she studied grief and loss in, in um, her grad program. And so has brought that perspective to some of the work because in addition to being traumatized, our clients are also grieving kind of the worst loss you could experience as a parent, which is separation from your child. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to April and Sadika to talk a little bit about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one of the things that I just want to start off by saying, you know, oh, most of our... Tell me when you want me to uh, switch the slide. Sorry, I think I'm... Oh, okay. Um, you can keep it there for now. Okay. Um, you know, like, it's, it's really important to have a deep understanding of our clients and their experiences. Whenever I get a new case, I really try to learn as much as I can about them, their strengths, um, their coping mechanisms, uh, their support, I want to learn about their support networks and their trauma history, um, because many of our clients are experiencing some form of trauma and are grieving some kind of loss. Um, I mean, just having, just experience, the experiencing of, uh, the experience of having a child removed is traumatic in of itself. So many of our clients are, are grieving the loss of their children. Um, so it's really important for us to understand trauma and grief and how that may impact our client and their ability to you know cope daily to function and to really achieve any of their um, goals their goals for reunification so before i get into that i just want to say i've had a lot of experience working with clients um, that are grieving and uh, that are dealing with trauma i'm not fully an expert um, and the information that I'm going to present is just like a tiny introduction to the field of trauma and grief. You know, there's a lot of information on this stuff, um, but we're just going to kind of provide like some of the basics. So to start, I just want to, um, I noticed I didn't put this slide up, but uh, talk about just define trauma, right? What is trauma? Um, trauma it's used to describe the experiences or situations that are emotionally painful and distressing and that overwhelm people's ability to cope, leaving them powerless, right? So this can include terrifying events such as violence or an assault, for, for an example. However, there are more subtle and insidious forms of trauma, such as discrimination, racism, oppression, and poverty that are pervasive and when experienced chronically, they have a cumulative impact that can be fundamentally life altering. So I just wanted to read those definitions. And just to kind of dig a little deeper, you can change the slide now. Um, so this iceberg, I would say, let's just say this may represent our client, right? You know, they're complex human beings like all of us. Um, the very top of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, what you see there, that's the, that's the behaviors that we might see in our clients, behaviors that may result from some of the traumatic experiences that they um, have had. And, you know, if it's emotional trauma, it may present in the form of like, you know, them being depressed or angry, or they may just appear to be like numb. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And what we see underneath the iceberg, so the bottom part, um, the invisible part is the foundation of those systems. And it's all a lot of those things that I mentioned earlier when I was defining trauma. I mean, it, it could be exposure to violence at a young age, um, somebody that was uh, victimized, um, the racism, co constant exposure to state sanctioned violence, poverty, all those things are underneath. So we have to keep in mind that um, when we see our clients behave in certain ways, there's, there's a lot more to that, right? We have to be mindful of the, you know, try not to react and really think what else is going on there. What, what else do I, what do I need to learn about this person? Um, because they're behaving this way for a certain reason. You can change it. Um, so how does trauma manifest? So again, I'm not, you know, I'm definitely not a brain researcher. Um, there's a larger point that I want to draw out here, but 
just briefly, this image here is of the brain and it's just to, to um, point out the fact that different parts of our brain um, control different, they have different functions and they control different emotions that we may have, right? So the, for example, the brain stem is the um, very bottom portion here. It's hard <laughs> to point to it. Um, but the brain stem main function is regulating body temperature, breathing and heartbeat. It's all about survival. And then if you look at the very top of the um, image, the cortex, um, that's the function of that is the higher order cognitive function. So that's like the thinking brain, right? Um, and then in the middle, there's, um, you know, the limbic midbrain that deals with like feelings and, and how we react to different things. Can you go to the next slide? So the main takeaway here is, if you look at this graph, I really like this graph. Um, the way we speak or interact, um, the way that our clients speak or interact will provide some insight into their brain state. So that will give us some idea of the kind of questions we can ask them and the information that um, the client will be able to provide us. So for example, um, if a client is in the terror brain state, right? They're probably in this fight or flight mode, which means they're pretty much close to um, shutdown mode. So a client that's in terror brain, in the terror brain state, it's not one where you want to be asking them a lot of questions. You know, you're not going to want to tell, okay, say, hey, okay, we have a, we, you need to do X, Y, Z, and um, the next court date is uh, going to be two months from now. Like, they're not going to remember any of that stuff. So the main thing you want to do for a client that's in terror mode is to try to create some kind of supportive envir environment for them. Because it could be a client that's freaking out in the courtroom. They're, they're very upset. So you want to remove them from that situation. You want to calm them down, maybe offer them some water, try to get them to breathe. And um, yeah, don't ask a lot of questions. But somebody that's in a calm state will be able to process the information a bit differently. Um, they might be able to take in more of the information that you're providing them. So that's very, you know, so keep that in mind when you're working with um, clients. Yeah, and I could just say, I, I, this chart, when I first saw it, I found it confusing. And then when I heard our social workers explain it, it really helped me. <laughs> but like, as an advocate, um, I don't know how many of you guys on this call have experienced, like, um, you told your client they needed to do X, Y, and Z, and then you call them the next day and like they totally don't know that they're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And I realize like a lot of that is because as a lawyer, I'm thinking about like, okay, what are the, I'm, I'm in my kind of calm future oriented sense of, of space as a lawyer. Um, and I wasn't necessarily meeting my client and they're like terror or fearful space where they can't think into the future. Their sense of time is not future oriented. So telling somebody, okay, tomorrow you're going to do this and then you're going to follow up with that. And then you're going to do that um, is completely ineffective when you're talking to someone who's in kind of that fear or terror mode, they're not able to think and plan into the future. And so this helped me so much as an advocate of recognizing like um, I need to, I first of all have an obligation to help my client get to a more calm brain state if I can at all, but then also um, not to um, have expectations of them to be able to operate in a future oriented um, time, like brain state when um, they're in crisis in, in this moment and they can only think about this particular moment. Um, go ahead, Sadika. So this is just a brief um, little statement here. Traumatic stress tends to evoke two emotional extremes, feeling either too overwhelmed or, or numb. Like I was saying earlier, those are some of the behaviors that you might see. Um, and I think there was something you wanted to say about that. Or, or maybe April or I, well, maybe we were just both talking about how our clients are so stigmatized um, for either being non-responsive or for being so angry. And I don't know, April, if you want to say anything about that. Yeah, you had an important point about trauma presents differently for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. The idea of someone acting appropriate or inappropriate to a traumatic experience, I find kind of ridiculous. I'm sorry. I don't know any other word that I can use for that. <laughs> Honestly, you, you, you know, to sit there and say, well, this mom is acting inappropriate or this child is acting inappropriate. 
to the trauma that we're forcing on them. It might not be us mm -hmm. specifically, but the system is forcing this trauma on its family and say, well, I'm going to put you in a completely unnatural state. I'm going to take away your basic dignity, your basic humanity, say you can't have your children, the child, you can't have your parents, and say, well, look at how they reacted. This is so inappropriate when trauma is, is personalized for the most part, right? And once again, I'm going to pull from my personal experience. I shut down. When things are um, too much for me and throughout my process in the child welfare system, I shut down my emotions. So someone from the outside looking in might say, well, this mom just don't care. In reality, my thought process was if I was to allow myself to truly feel these emotions, I would implode. I would just give up. I, like I can't live. Like my heart would just be ripped inside of my chest. So let me shut down my emotions. That's my survival mechanism that I learned throughout my trauma, throughout my life. So everyone's mechanisms and how they handle trauma is different. So until we are able to actually stand in their shoes, so to speak, and this is where I'm kind of plugging in my position why New Jersey needs some peer advocates around. Until you understand that and say, well, I cannot judge a parent by how they react or lack thereof when I don't understand that pain and that true trauma that's going on. Mm -hmm. So to be trauma informed, which a lot of you know agencies say they are, but still use the words like inappropriate or appropriate behavior, that's not really trauma informed. Because if you were, you will understand that everyone's personality is different. Everyone's reactions is different. And I cannot judge you on how you handle your grief. You might shut down. You might go use drugs. You might go drinking. You might, you know, lash out and end mm -hmm. up in handcuffs because you don't fought half the world because you didn't know how to process your trauma at that moment. Well, yeah, you pretty nailed the, the next slide. You, you covered yeah, most of the stuff. Of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, and they might find it difficult to, people experiencing trauma might find it difficult to trust others, you know, because they've been, um, especially if they're involved in the system, because the system has inflicted harm to them in other ways. And, you know, or they they had other family members that were involved in the system that might not have had good outcomes. So it's, it's it, it might take a while for the for us to build that trust with the client but we could move on i mean i think april pretty much covered most of the stuff there um so i now want to move on to talking about grief disenfranchised grief in particular um so oftentimes as of late there's been a lot of buzz around you know being trauma informed i mean everybody most a lot of organizations that work with human beings um are in some ways trying to be trauma informed or they say it on paper but may not practice it but either way there's less um people talking about grief there aren't enough people talking about grief in the way that it may impact clients um so disenfranchised grief is grief resulting from a loss that's hidden not socially supported um openly acknowledged or publicly mourned and i'm going to talk a little bit about that we're going to break that down a little bit more and you can go to the next one. So what is loss, right? There are many different kinds of losses. Often when we think about loss, we think about bereavement loss. And that's, you know, and that's essentially um, losing a loved one through death, right? The less known form of loss is ambiguous loss. And ambiguous loss is lo love of a, um, a loved one is physically or psychologically absent. So for many of our clients, for example, they might be experiencing ambiguous loss. Um, they know their child is alive. They might be living with a foster parent somewhere or with a kinship caregiver somewhere. So, you know, they may talk to them a lot, but they're not physically present. Um, so that's a form of a loss they may suffer. Or, you know, some people understand ambiguous loss as having a family member that's, um, experiencing de dementia. So 
they're there, they're physically present, but psychologically they're not there, they might not remember who you are, et cetera. So that's ambiguous loss. Then there are more subtle and less obvious losses. Many, some of our clients might experience identity loss, right? So um, the biological mother knows that, or, or father knows that they're the parent, but the fact that they're no longer, they might not be the, um, have physical or legal guardianship over the child um, might be challenging for them. So they might question, you know, like, am I really the mother anymore? Like, what's my role right now? Since I'm not like the one taking responsible for the child at this point. And then moving to a new home, I threw that up there. Um, some of our clients end up once they become DHS involved, they may lose some of their benefits. So that might um, put some clients in a situation where they may end up losing, you know, public housing or something like that. So losing a house could be a, a, a form of a loss. You could go to the next. And now let's talk about grief. So grief, grieving is really important. You know, scholars have talked about the ways that um, grief work is an important um, process that people who are experiencing losses have to go through in order to really heal. And um, it's also important to note that everyone grieves differently. Some of us might think our clients aren't grieving because um, if you look down below, there's different styles of grieving. There's intuitive grievers or instrumental grievers. Some people, when they um, are experiencing pain, they cry, they're very emotional. And then others are not, they're more, they might intellectualize the problem. They're more of a heady kind of person, right? And um, so they wanna, they may avoid the pain in, in some kind of, in, 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 by keeping themselves occupied in, in different ways. So that's also important to know not to judge our clients if they're not um, grieving in a way that we expect them to grieve, right? Um, and then also the way that people experience grief may vary depending on, um, could be the age of the child. Maybe if it's a newborn, if, if it's the first time they've ever experienced a loss, it might, they might feel it more um, heavily. You know, they might be, um, it might be more difficult for them to, to kind of work through that grief. Um, and if they experience a secondary loss, that may also complicate the grieving process. So one, they have their child taken away and then the secondary loss is, you know, losing the home or they, you know, it's COVID right now. So maybe they experience a death in a family. So these are secondary losses that may compound the grief, um, making it more difficult to kind of work through the emotions and all of that. And there's no set time frame for grief. You could, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. So back to disenfranchised grief. Um, Oftentimes, this out of the grief class that I took when I was in school, the one concept that really resonated with me the most was this concept of disenfranchised grief because of the type of work that I do in the populations that I work with, having worked with incarcerated people, victims of domestic violence, uh, survivors of domestic violence and assault, and, and especially now people involved in the child welfare system. Their grief is, tends to be overlooked or not acknowledged because of society's perception of them, right? So um historically society has devalued um black mothers right the dominant culture has devalued them um therefore making their grief less um worthy like it, they're not worthy of um our attention or support because they deserve to be grieving because they were the bad mom or they deserve to um like, why should we care about this particular person? Because the parent is incarcerated, they're a bad person. So, which isn't always the case. So um, that's why for me, it's really important to talk about this concept. And especially because if we don't recognize that people are grieving, then we might be overlooking, um, we're not really able to help the client in a way that they need to be helped. We're not really able to provide them the resources that they need. Um, so you might not be able to get far along with the client and, and the stuff they have to do to close out their case because of these different barriers that present themselves because of, because they're grieving. <laughs> they need to see a therapist. They need to be in a support group. They, or we need to make policy changes <laughs> so that we can really help people in, in real 
meaningful ways um, by making housing available or internet access available and things like that. Um, so with disenfranchised grief, these are just some examples. Um, the loss isn't seen as worthy of grief. The, re the relationship is stigmatized in some cases, um, a partner in an extramarital affair. Um, the way someone is, is of grieving, the way that someone is grieving is stigmatized. So we talked about that. They're not grieving in a stereotypical way. You can go to the next slide. Um, so here are some more examples of disenfranchised grief. Um, they might, a, a client might be grieving family separation due to foster care, um, loss of independence. You know, once you're DHS involved, once you're involved in the child welfare system, you have all kinds of people that are surveilling you. You don't really have a sense of private privacy, right, anymore. Um, everything, your whole life is on like public display in, in some sense. So these are just some examples. I kind of had a comment about this. I, one, I mean, this concept of disenfranchised grief like helped me so much in recognizing what my clients went through. But I'll, also, my, my guess is um, most of you have experienced disenfranchised grief in some way and know the pain of being in mourning and being in grief and having people not recognize that you're in grief. So like when somebody you love dies, you get a funeral and people recognize you as a griever. Um, but if you like, for instance, have a miscarriage or go through a divorce or lose a job you loved, you are in grief, but people don't recognize it as grief. And it's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing to experience. And when I started to kind of connect those dots and recognize, oh, I've been in that situation where I've been grieving, but no one knew I was grieving. And then, um, recognizing that not only are we doing this and not not identifying what our clients are experience as, experiencing as grief, we're often doing something even worse, which is stigmatizing them for what are normal grief responses. Hmm. Thank you for that. And here are the responses you can use yourself. <laughs> right, so these are some grief reactions. Um, clients might feel like they're going crazy. They might feel sad or depressed. Um, feel like they want to escape. They might experience a sense of guilt or remorse. They might feel frustrated or misunderstood, lack motivation or energy. Um, they might be anxious, nervous. So they might, so these are some of the things that you might see, some things that you might want to look out for um, in your clients. Sadika, if I may, I just want to point something out to you guys. Yeah, please. With that piece. So if you have a client that says, y'all in the middle of y'all case, the case just started and she don't, she or he, don't start doing their objectives until maybe five months in, that can be that grieving process. Because sometimes it takes that long for a person to wrap their head around, like I have to go through all these hoops. So if a client isn't from the very beginning you know, getting into the treatment, following all their objectives and things like that. Just keep that in mind because sometimes they're grieving that through that process. So they might not have that motivation to start because they can't wrap their head around their grief. Such a good point. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to move on to um, working with clients in crisis. Uh, these are like tips we would use every day, but um, uh, the crisis is exponential right now because of COVID. Um, so I want to spend some time working through that. Um, I know we only have like 15 minutes left and we do want to kind of um, make sure we're getting to your questions. So um, now would be a good time to start typing in your questions and we'll try to like save a couple minutes at the end um, to respond to your questions. But um, I, I want to really make sure we spend some time focusing on, on communication because um, one thing I learned as a lawyer that no one taught me in law school <laughs> is um, how you as a lawyer show up in your relationships with your clients um, is going to have an, an Im immense impact on their ability to succeed. And so how you show up with them during a crisis and how you communicate with them really can change outcomes uh, for families and kids. So I'm gonna um, 
turn it over to Saka to first start talking about um, how how do you meet somebody who's in grief? Um, so here are some basic tips. You know, one is show some compassion. Try to be um, empathic. Show some empathy because understand they're angry, they're scared, right? Um, so just try to listen to the clients. So use reflective listening. I mean, really just try to put yourself in their shoes, right? Like I couldn't imagine having my 14 month old taken from me. And like, I, I would, you would probably think I'm a crazy person or whatever. I mean, nobody wants to go through that experience. Um, so just kind of, if, if somebody's expressing a lot of emotions, we just kind of have to check ourselves and just pause for a minute and just like, say like, hey, I can under, I understand, I can't understand what you're going through. I mean, I, I you know, I'm sure you're in a lot of, um, you know, might be feeling angry or a lot of um, pain, but I'm here to help you. I'm here to work with you. Um, and, you know, let them know like, your kids are, they're going to be safe, you know, we, although that's kind of, <laughs> we want to, but we want to let them know we did some, you know, DHS or, you know, the child welfare system is supposed to do some kind of check on the families that they're staying with, you know, and that, you know, so just try to help them to, to know that they, their kids will be safe, that we're going to make sure they have some kind of contact with the kid, with their children. Um, so, but I would just say the main thing on this slide to keep in mind is to be, to show some empathy and to really just listen to them. And that can be really hard to do, so. Also, acknowledge the situation that they're in. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, you just had your child taken from you and you might be feeling scared or um, you might be feeling a number of things and it's normal to feel those feelings that you're feeling. Anybody, like you have the right to be angry. Um, but I'm here to, we're gonna do all that we can. This is what I tell my clients. I know you're pissed, the system is messed up. I'm gonna do everything that I can to help you, to work with you. And, and I'm sure all, all of you all are, are doing this already, um, but, what kind of support do you need from me right now? Um, what's the best way that I can support you? You know, I, ex I explain my role and, you know, as a social worker and, and just try to hear from them, really try to listen from them, like what they need. And, and oftentimes they'll let you know. Um, and if they don't know at the moment, I'll let them know it's okay. You can reach out to me whenever you're ready. I'm, I'm available. I'm always here for you. When I say I'm gonna call you back, I will call you back. You can rely on me. Um, so I, I do try to be very genuine in my communication and very transparent. Um, that's one thing that I do, because I just, I can't imagine what my clients are going through. That's always like at the, like, I, so I always want, and we know sometimes with the KUA workers, they might not be as responsive. So I just want to be that person that they can always rely on. So I, I'm always like, I will call you in a few days. If you don't hear from me, give me a call back. But I will always like, so I just try to really assure them that I'm, I'm there for them. Um, but also, again, being willing to sit in silence, you know, like April and I were talking about earlier, especially in the beginning of COVID, it was just overwhelming um, for many of our clients. And I had, I just had to hear many of my clients cry on the phone and just be like, you know, it's okay. And just be on the phone with them for an hour or more and just listen to them. And they all really appreciate it. Although it doesn't feel like you're doing much, it, it means so much to them. Um, because oftentimes people just, especially, I don't want to put hate on the, like, um, the cool workers, but for many of them, it's like they're checking off a, you know, a little notebook, like, okay, they're compliant. They, they are, um, their kids are up to date with medical. Like that's all they're focused on. They're not really providing from what I've seen so far that like emotional and um, support that they need that, you know, to sit with them. I don't think they're listening to them and that's not all who was fault. They're overwhelmed, we're all overwhelmed, but we just have to kind of create those spaces. It, it's important to do that if we're trying to really build trust with our clients and to really help them move towards their goals. So we can go on to the next one. 
So here are some additional tips, some more practical tips. Um, we're gonna talk about um, ways that we can regulate ourselves and ways, things that we can do to better relate to our clients and to um, reason with our clients. So. Did you wanna do that one? Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. I, <laughs> I actually am really passionate about this slide. I was like, I want to talk about this because um, one thing that I kind of learned the hard way and actually, and also just learned from having like awesome expertise in my office is um, often the best predictor of how um, an interaction you have with a client in crisis is going to turn out is how you show up. And so I think early in my career, I was like, oh, how am I going to get this client to, to listen to me and to hear me? And I, I, they're in crisis and I hope that they're going to be able to hear what I have to say. And I wasn't really like processing like, oh, like how, whether they're able to succeed actually depends a lot in how I show up in this moment. And so when you are um, dealing with someone in crisis, the first thing that you need to do is check your own behavior and reflect on how you're showing up in that moment. Um, and there are some things that you can do that will dramatically change the course of your interaction with your client. So regulating your own behavior is the first step in dealing with a client in crisis. So first of all, give them your full attention, show attentiveness. Um, don't be on your phone, don't be in other conversations, like give them your full attention, stay calm um stay, keep your voice calm like my, believe me my clients have yelled at me and threatened me and told me I'm a terrible human being <laughs> um I've heard it all um but engaging in a back and forth uh is not productive um it doesn't move us towards where we need to go um if you can slow things down if your client is throwing a million things at you at once and you, you don't even understand what they're saying I think you can model a, sl a slow, calm voice and then ask them, say, I really want to listen to you. Um, can we talk, go back to the first thing you said? Can we slow down? I'm going to, one thing I'll say sometimes is I'm going to take all the time we need to have this conversation. Um, so don't worry. <laughs> I'm going to take the time to finish this conversation with you. And then part of that is showing them that you are going to let them have their say um, and, and, fully be heard. And if you have to interrupt, be clear about why you're doing it and um, make, make it clear that you're going to come right back to them. Um, and we're going to talk about the relate to your client. So it's definitely important to relate to your client. I'm going to take my professional hat off for a second and talk to you guys as a parent. One of the reasons why I became an activist is because I felt as though my voice was unheard. The worst thing you can do in that type of situation, especially with a client client in crisis, is not validate their feelings or th their experience at that moment. You know, most people, we gotta, we have our own time clocks and you have 20, 30 different things to do. So you gotta, you try to push past the issue or tell the client to like, like, can we hurry up this process? Can you feel these emotions a little faster? You know, I got this stuff, stuff I got to do. And in doing so, you might not do it like that, but in doing so, you are leaving them voiceless. And for me, I know that's one of the worst feelings I experienced is feeling like I didn't have a voice in my own case. Like, I didn't have a voice and Every, how everything is going up. So I'm already in crisis. I'm already, I already lost my children. On top of that, I have no voice. So all control that I have had throughout my life with my family is gone. So 100% validate their feelings and their experience. But I also talk a lot about empathy and this goes into play in who I am and a peer parent advocate. You guys need one. I'm just telling y'all. Um, but definitely express empathy. Just understand or, or step into their shoes for a few minutes and understand how hard this is to go through a process like this. How Sometimes it's hard to even bring up a concern to your lawyer and say, hey, I don't like how this is going. Hey, I don't necessarily want to fight for this. Hey, can we do that? So it took a lot of courage and strength for them to come to you with something 
that you might think is basic, but it really took them a lot, especially during crisis mode. So also agree, we all know the system is shattered. I wouldn't say broken, it's shattered. It's messed up. And it's okay to tell your clients like, yeah, this is messed up. I might curse, you know, at that point. But like, yes, this is messed up. And I understand this is completely unfair. But let's try to deal with this solution. What can we do to get to the point to where we get these people out of your life? That's what we got to focus on, that solution. But 100%, this is messed up. I hear you. Yes, cool, sucks. Yes, diaper sucks. They all suck. Let's try to get this. <laughs> what do we need to do next? Hi, everyone. I just need to remind you to fill out your forms and make sure that you email them to Judy. And the CLE code is dynamite. Again, the CLE code is dynamite. Do we want to leave a few minutes for some questions. Yeah. Um, so, Sadika, do you want to briefly go over this um, reasoning with your client and then we want to move into questions? Okay. Yeah. So the last one is um, reason with your client. And somebody just wrote transparency, something about transparency. And I transparency with clients is key. That is how trust is formed. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, with this last point, um, you know, like I said a little bit earlier, our clients are, they're anxious and, you know, this is a very chaotic time for them. Um, they don't know, many of them aren't sure. There's like a lot of uncertainty. So I try to really communicate, um, like this is the responsibility. These are the things that I am gonna do. These are the actions that I'm gonna take. Um, I just try to be clear about the goals and the steps that we're taking together with clients. Um, Cause I'm like, I know you don't wanna have to go through, you know, treatment or whatever it is, you know, DHS is asking a lot of you, but what can we do? What small steps can we take to, to help you towards accomplishing some of those things? And um, so, yeah, I try to take accountability for the things that I need to do. I try to, communicate clearly with them and say, I'm going to call you. I'll do this for you. I can help you. I can give you the number so you can sign up for this treatment class. And I'll call you back in a couple of days to see like how the intake process went. So like we're in this together and um, we're going to figure this out. So I just try to be clear um, and try to walk through the steps that they have to take together with them as much as I can. And we're gonna just skip this last slide, but um, please take a, a moment to look at this when you get the PowerPoint. Um, we try to implement a trauma-informed approach in our office, and you know, obviously, the child welfare system has failed in in creating a trauma-informed system for parents. But I think it's worth thinking through how we could be the change we want to see in the world by implementing this and how we engage with our clients. Um, but uh, I think we're almost out of time. We probably are out of time. Kathleen, one of the big questions I see is that everyone seems to want to know how you got the ASFA timelines told mm -hmm. and the steps that you did do that. I heard you mention um, that it went up to the Supreme Court in PA. So our PA Supreme Court had issued a standing order saying that local counties could toll any, any filing deadlines necessary due to the pandemic. And so our office went to our supervising judge and said, well, the ASFA filing deadline in the Pennsylvania Juvenile Act is um, something that needs to be told um, because clients aren't getting access to visits, they're not getting access to services. And he agreed with us. And so he put it in the standing order that the ASFA timeline is told. Um, he put it in the initial one that we helped draft in April, and then he just did a new standing order in August and issued that as well. Um, and we think that's very much in line with the um, language in the federal guidance that suggests that um, lack of access to services sh uh, should be considered a compelling reason not to file TPR petitions, but we know that all over the place, um, courts and agencies are ignoring that federal guidance. And so that's why we're really excited also about pushing federal legislation to make this clear. Yes, I think that if you could put, wanna put that slide back up with that hashtag. 
uh, oh yeah, I know that. Oh my God, I know. So you can see the, let me see if I can go back to that. Cause I do, if you can call your legislator, mm -hmm. if you know anybody who can help us move this legislation, we are, we just think it's so important. Um, and in the PowerPoint, I know Claudia, you're going to share the PowerPoint. I mean, yes. it's our, our contact information is in there. So if folks want to connect on any of this or are looking for resources, um, we often consult with people all over the place and happy to hear from you. Thank you guys so, so, so much for doing this. I can't tell you how much we appreciate it and how just beneficial it is to see that there are other states and other individuals like us fighting the good fight um, and to see your collaborative approach. Uh, April and Sadika, thank you so much. Your input on this and perspectives have been invaluable and hopefully we can take that here in New Jersey and, and work with it. So thank you and Kathleen, thank you and Mimi, thank you so much. Much appreciated everyone. Thank you. <laughs> we really enjoyed this. Please, you know, keep contact us if you have any questions. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to have a longer Q and A period, but you know we're available. Our contact information, um, Claudia has our contact information. We can make sure you get it somehow. So. Yes, and I'll be sending out the PowerPoint slides oh. to everybody that registered. Once we get your forms back, we'll send out the PowerPoint slides. So make sure that you fill out your forms. Again, the CLE code with Dynamite. Thank Bye. you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mimi.